Good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be at this Innovation Summit and I had a chance to look at some of the really cool stuff outside in the hallway. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really interested in the energy equipment and all this kind of stuff, but there's also a lot of software and data which is hard to see. Um, I guess it's inside the green boxes everywhere. Anyway, uh, we're here to talk about innovation. I'm going to be chairing a panel. Be before we get started, I do want to correct a little bit of misused terminology because I'm a professor and it's kind of my job. So in, in the last panel and, and all through these days, you hear about disruption. Disruption this, disruptive that. Disruption was a, the word as it applies to innovation was, in, was coined by a guy called Clay Christensen who works at the Harvard Business School. And he wrote an article in 1995 in the Harvard Business Review. What he says is that, that new technology, which could be called radical technology or architectural technology or new business models, all kinds of new technology, and there's lots of words to describe it, sometimes big companies don't get the message. They don't move fast enough. Um, and a new technology comes along which is cheaper, lighter, faster, greener, or for some reason is better than the old technology, but isn't necessarily as good as the old technology when it comes out. Typically, big companies like BlackBerry ignore new technologies like smartphones because it's not very good at something like email. What happens next is somebody else develops the technology, and sometimes they get so far ahead that when the world switches to the new technology, the people who were dominating in that business before could not keep up, and they get disrupted. So when we talk about really cool stuff, to call it disruptive technology is perhaps a mistake, because we don't know what's going to happen yet in the industry. If the people in the industry manage to get this stuff through their heads and, and develop new products like Schneider Electric's doing, it's not disruptive anymore. It's just really cool. Yeah. Uh, electric cars. Are electric cars disruptive technology? Well, let's imagine that the entire fleet is electric in 20 years. If those cars are called Fords, Nissans, and Toyotas, it wasn't disruptive. If those cards are called Teslas, Simmonses, and why not Schneider Electricus? Yes, will there be a Schneider Electric car? This will, be, this will be the evidence that this has been disruptive technology. Yeah? I hope that's clear. It's important to me as a professor that we use the words properly, and we can talk about radical technology, we can talk about new technology, we can talk about exciting business models and going from CapEx to OpEx and all of this stuff, but we should use the word disruption carefully. With that, let me introduce our panel, because we have a fantastic panel. We have uh, Susanna Quintana from Galp, Arancha Spelta from Acciona, and your own Emmanuel Lagarigue from Schneider Electric. Please join me up here, panelists. So good, after, good uh, morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us on the panel. Uh, I've been talking about disruption, and, and all of you have more or less the same job in your different companies, which is to be responsible for wild innovation, to give it a name, which perhaps is not the name you use. Um, and what I want to ask you in the next few minutes is, um, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And how hard has it been? Uh, when Emmanuel first asked me if I could do this, I said, how many hours do we have? And I said, he said, oh, yeah, 45 minutes. So I've always used up two. So try to be a little bit brief in your remarks. But can I start with you, Susanna? What are you doing on this whole question of wild innovation at Gallup? So good question. Uh, what am I doing in wild innovation at Gallup? Many of you may laugh, but let's say my number one job is to bring renewables into Gallup. So while everybody thinks that's quite normal now and quite mainstream, for an oil and gas company, I was going to say it's quite disruptive, but now I will watch the world, and I will say it's quite innovative. So I'm in charge of bringing the renewable business from 8 megawatts to tens of gigawatts. I'm in charge of new business, very much centered on the centralized energy. Um, and finally, I'm also in charge of innovation and corporate venture, something that also for an oil and gas company sounds like something from another planet. Yeah, I mean, so the question is, you know, who's going to make the energy of tomorrow? And if GALP is in the renewable business, then they may not be disrupted, is that? 
Well, I guess I, uh, two days ago I was in a Wood Mackenzie um, uh, conference, and they were talking that the world will move from big oil to big energy. And I will even challenge that, because I don't think with the centralized energy and with renewables you don't need big energy. You need the centralized energy. So I think the change for the industries and companies like us that are used to huge capex investments, to very risky business with very high IRRs, to move into more service business, to move more into OPEX business, uh, is going to be a, a big challenge. Fantastic, Arancha. Uh, Axiona, the biggest construction company, I think, in this part of the world. Lots and lots of stuff going on. What are, what are you guys working on? What's, what's important? Well, I think that we are trying to build the innovation model that really works for us. And uh, I think that there is not a single or a unique answer to those questions. So, uh, well, obviously we're working in sustaining innovation, just trying to implement any technology advancement that can help us be more efficient, more productive. We're also trying to build up capabilities in new business models, just to be ready, like for the medium term. But also, um, and although it's very difficult for big companies to really be disruptive, and especially be disruptive in their own sectors, I think that what big companies can do is try to be prepared for that, no? I mean, it's very difficult to know when and how things are gonna happen, and especially at the, at the speed of these new technological changes that we're seeing in all different sectors. But I think that what we can do is build mechanisms to gain flexibility and agility, and that's something very relevant for big corporations. So in that respect, uh, what we're doing within Acciona, obviously are not very different what other companies are working on. Uh, we're building and, and evolving our innovation model to be more open and more digital, which are two main characteristics that we need to build up on top of what are our innovation current skills, which are very much and uh, very good, but very focused on our current businesses. So in that respect, we have created an open innovation platform where we have developed programs with this whole innovation, where we are just publishing all our challenges in our current sectors and just inviting companies all over the world to provide solutions to help us find the right, the, the right tech, tech technologies no, to, to afford uh, and to really tackle those, those challenges. We're also developing an entrepreneurship program within ACCIONA. We also want our employees to help us finding the solutions to those challenges. No? We know that we have within the company great talent, great knowledge about what we do our, and also about what we can do in the future and we want to provide them with it platforms and tools for them to incorporate those solutions and help us build on that. And uh, in terms of the digital part of that, uh, and we're coming to sectors, some of those, you know, because we are a very big and diverse company, um, in which, uh, but we're coming in some sectors in a, on a more traditional way where digitalization was not present at all, and we know that we need to keep up and, and, and really catch up on those as well. And so on that we have built what we call the, a digital hub. In, in a digital hub? Yes within the innovation area, just work in and, and organize around six skill centers that basically are aiming to gain capabilities and know-how in around what we think are the digital technologies that would impact more in our, in our businesses. No? And mainly it's talking about robotics, AI, 3D printing, IoT. The, the, the usual kind of suspects, things. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, so that's basically how we're getting prepared for the future. Fantastic, and, and Emmanuel, maybe you can tell us a little bit what Schneider's doing, kind of to push things beyond the green boxes and into the future. Well, precisely, beyond the green boxes. So, for, so I think the first concept you, you need to, uh, we need to, to be on the same page uh, on is that you need innovation at the core. You need the green boxes to be the best green boxes in the market and beating competition and, and uh, um, increasing your market share and, uh, and, and, and generating growth for your, your stakeholders, your customers, your people, the planet, uh, and your shareholders. Uh, now, if you just do this, it may not be enough. Uh, and if you want to make sure uh, that everybody has uh, access to energy and digital in the future, maybe there will be other people thinking uh, about that value proposition uh, with different technologies, different business models. So we just want to augment our innovation with this Innovation at the Edge uh, program, which is about uh, 
sticking our head outside, working with universities, with venture capitalists, with startups, with other large companies uh, to create new business models, uh, to bring new technologies uh, to Schneider Electric, uh, to make sure that we remain uh, ahead of, uh, of our competition, our current competition and our future competition. And uh, let me just stay with you, why? I mean, the, the, the world is kind of breaking in Schneider Electric's favor, uh, transition to a low carbon economy, electrification of the planet. Probably if you just keep making the best green boxes in the world, everything would be fine. Why, why go out past the edge? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, this is a good point. So we are, we have the good luck uh, if, uh, to be to be positioned in two markets where where you have uh, disruptions, important disruption happening. There are probably five big disruptions happening in the in the world these days, and two of them uh, are in our uh, in, in our field. So it's about leveraging that uh, to to advantage. Yeah, the one of energy and the one of digital and AI. Uh, I mean, biotech will be another one. We're not in that yet. Uh, <laughs> and there are a few others uh, uh, that also uh, we could also mention. But the, the point is, uh, what Susanna was, was, was saying uh, for an oil and gas company, thinking uh, that the world will be a, a world of decentralized energy, well, that's counterintuitive. And, uh, and I'm sure that the competitors that, and the, the, the environment that Gulp will will face in terms of business model will be very different from a one day phase. Same, same here. Uh, so, um, and especially the disruption in energy, at, we are just at the beginning of it. That market is ripe for a very big, uh, for a big, uh, very big change. I would uh, say the potential disruption of energy. Yeah. Because sure. today the energy mix on the planet, if I remember correctly, is still gas, oil, coal. The electric utilities are still playing a role. They haven't died yet. Unless I'm misinformed. 70% uh, of uh, CapEx deployed in uh, energy generation is in renewable these days, right? So, and you can ask those ladies, their companies are pretty involved in, in this type of, uh, of businesses. So it's a reality. It's becoming a reality. But we are, I agree with you. It's, we are just at the beginning of uh, something that's going to, to go very, very fast in the next decade. Of the transformation of the energy platform. Arantxa. The transformation of, of how electricity is being generated transported, distributed, shared, uploaded, downloaded, uh, and the players that will do that. Will do that. A, ranch, a construction company, you know, building a digital hub, getting entrepreneurship from its people, opening up the partnerships. Why? I mean, that's not normal, is it? Yes, and imagine a renewable company. We started being a construction company, and we became a renewable energy company. I really think, and that was at the early 90s when we decided to do that. Imagine everyone was thinking that we were a little bit crazy, no, entering to the, this market when no one believed on that. Regulation was not even there yet in some of the countries, and we decided to do that. We, we firmly believed that that's what we had to do, no? And we were able to disrupt the electricity system, especially from a construction company, no? And we have to fight against, like, companies that were more based in, like, in the traditional, um, in the conventional sources of energy, and we had very clear that we only wanted to, to work in renewable energies, no? So, um, yes, um, taking it from what Emmanuel was saying, I think there's been really big change. There is a still, of course, um, a, still a road to, 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 to continue, but I think that's been a very big change. I think almost no one now really won't take renewables into the energy system equation, no? So, and sorry, I'll get back to your question. Why? Well, I think that first and in the short term, because I think we need to differentiate. You, you need to do that to differentiate yourself. You need to use innovation to really generate competitive advantages to your current businesses, and that's how we start it all, no? You need to gain efficiency and productivity, especially in this global environment where there are huge competitors all over the world. So that's a good way to start, but you need to build the capabilities for the medium and for the long term. And that's where, precisely because that's where the disruption may come. How long is the medium and the long term? We don't know. And I think, I mean, we don't know. No one knows. That's what I was saying at the beginning. And it's very difficult. I mean, we can try all to guess, but we have no idea. And that's the reality. And that's why I say all you can do is try to be ready for that. No? And it's very difficult to try to predict the future 
it's simply impossible. And even the pace at which things are going to happen, it's just impossible to know. But you need to be ready for that, just building the mechanisms, getting the knowledge, gaining agility, and to be ready for that and to be part of that disruption as well. No? So as I said, why? Initially, because you need to differentiate in the long term, because you want to be resilient. You want to be there when this disruption comes. No? And I think that's why innovation and technology is so important for the companies. At the, at the business school, I, I would agree with you. We, 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 we say you cannot predict the future, but you can develop scenarios for the future. And looking at this scenario or that scenario, and then look at the capabilities you have in exactly. these different scenarios and say, do I have what I need to, to have in these different futures? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah? Susanna, why? Why, um, why does an oil company you know, go into renewables? A, a construction company went in the 1990s, and now the renewable company is jumping in. What, what's the story? So I, I think it's clear for everyone uh, on the why. Uh, we all know that oil is going to peak sooner, more than later. Uh, we all know the world is moving to renewables. Peak oil, this idea that, that, that oil will yeah, as I mentioned, I was in this conference, and I heard everything the same that I have been hearing for the last five, 10 years in clean tech conference. The only difference this time was being said by an oil and gas conference. So that was pretty, pretty impactful. <laughs> let, let me focus instead maybe on the why, because I think it's quite obvious. It's on the what. And I'll tell you how I approach in innovation. I'm very pragmatic about innovation. I am not trying to predict the future. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel at all. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to have my eyes out there to see everything that is happening and to try to partner with those ones that need my help in order to accelerate into the market and I need their help for innovation. So in my previous life, I set up the venture arm of um, E.ON um, before running the technology and innovation. And before joining Gulp, I was a partner with Next47, the venture arm of Siemens. And what I learned is, Startups are much faster than us. They don't have the governance, the rules, the issues that you have of being a large corporation. It's not that that is bad, it's what you need to run a large corporation. They can move fast, they have access to capital, they don't have to obey all the rules of the market. But all startups, mostly in the B2B market, have an issue, access to market. We do have the access to the market. We do have the brand, we do have the customers. So I have always taken a very pragmatic approach. I'm not looking for the next startup. I'm looking for the scale up who has proven the technology on market A or with customer A. And I partner with them to help them come into my market, into my customer. And what does that partnership mean? Do you make investments in them? Do you, do you bring them into Galp? Do you give them Galp uh, t-shirts and Galp employee numbers? Or yeah. what does it really mean? So I'll tell you what it means for me. Uh, I think investing in startups is important, and I think everybody stepped in up corporate venture funds, and I set up one, and I think it's, it's key for a series of reasons. But for me, even more important than the investment in the startup is to have a ring fence team of people and budget where you can help launch the first pilots, the first program. Ring fence, startup. so you build a fence around it so the rest of the organization can't eat it up. Is not that... necessarily, not necessarily. So I'll, I'll tell you how we did it at E.ON, uh, and I'm doing the same thing at Calp, that I found it very, very powerful. At E.ON, I'm not going to say how much we had into the venture fund, but it wasn't much, but we had 130 million for early commercialization programs. So I'll give you an example. There was a company called Opower, who was already quite successful in the US in customer engagement. And I went to Opower and I said, I'll open the UK market for you. We have 5 million customers in the UK market in exchange for an investment in the company. Uh, we opened Opower to the UK market and E.ON went, actually I'm going to say it wasn't E.ON, it was even me. The first time I heard Opower and they told me about customer engagement, I said, who's the customer and why do we need to engage with them? <laughs> uh, and at the end of Opa, Because you're an electric utility, you know. You, you, yeah, you didn't care about it, uh, who was the customer. And I'll tell you, by the end of, of, of the deployment of, of Opower, customer engagement was the number one line in every company presentation. So I'm very pragmatic. I don't look for something that is five, ten years from now. I look for something that needs to scale up today. I partner with them. I give them the first, a team that does the first product introduction. And then if successful, the business has to hand it over. 
And I think in order to bring innovation, you have to be very fast with early success. Now, for the entrepreneurs in the room, that's Susana Quintana <laughs> at gallup.com. Is that right? I'll tell them later. OK. Yes. <laughs> but I think, yeah, just to rebound on this, uh, this, is, this is the key part, right? So when you do a corporate venture or this type of, you want to really make the collaboration efficient. This is why we have quite a few startups here in that showroom. And you see they are completely uh, embedded in the booth, because this is the partnership. This is where it takes place, right? So you want to manage very well the distance right, or the ring fence bet between the, the startup and the, and, and the, and the business, uh, uh, and make sure that all the way you manage the expectations on both sides. Because the first meeting between a startup and a, and a corporate always goes very well. A lot of excitement. Oh, the first wow. meeting. The first meeting, yes. yeah. Oh, look at that technology, that product, fantastic. With an army of uh, R&D people, we're not able to do it. And these two guys in a the garage, they did it. Um, and then on the other side, the entrepreneur is like, wow, I've arrived. Uh, I'm in 130 countries. I have a sales force of 30,000 people working for me. Uh, so that's the first meeting. And then comes the second meeting, uh, which is while well, the entrepreneur realizes that there's a bit of bureaucracy to get to this <laughs> one of uh, 120 countries. And the corporate realizes that, well, yeah, the product is not finished, is not perfect, as, as you were mm. saying at the beginning. So, so it's very important to manage that relationship very, very well. Let me, let me just stay with you for a moment, uh, Susanna. How hard is this? I mean, you did it. You did it at Eon. You did it at Simmons, and now you're starting to do it at Gallup. How how difficult is it to get one of these organizations to move? What um, what the former CEO of uh, IBM called getting an elephant to dance. Yeah. So I think the number one step of getting the elephant to dance is to hear making hear the music. Uh, what I mean <laughs> with that is uh, you really getting the elephant to hear the music. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is the the number one step is to to have that sense of urgency that the market is shrinking. To tell you the truth, so far it's been easier, easier at Gulp than it was at Eon. Why? Because Gulp is already conscious of the urgency of the innovation. When we started at Eon, that urgency wasn't there yet. And the education of the people to hear the music took a lot of time. I think after you have the sense of urgency, the biggest issue is two, is understanding the new markets, I will call it education of the new market, and second of them, inertia. Uh, so mostly when you have a great engineering company or oil and gas company, there are a bunch of experts who know their markets very well and are really to take bets and make different things based on the knowledge of the market. Then somebody shows up and talks about something completely different they can grasp. That's difficult for them. Even if they understand you and they believe you, they cannot validate how good your idea is. So you have to spend a lot of time on really educating them, trying to get them to understand the basics, the typical acronyms, the typical IRR, presenting different people in the industry to make them grasp what this business is about. So sometimes it's not that they don't want it, it's just they are not familiar with it. Second is inertia. Everybody, and I see it so many times, everybody puts these great slides on innovation and how we're gonna change the world and how everything else, and then, after they are done with this great vision, they go back to the operating business and they start doing everything exactly the same. So to break that, to, bre to break the, the inertia and to make people understand that while the operating business are key, otherwise you don't have the money for the innovation, you have to start dedicating a significant amount of time to the new business and giving them the same visibility and the same time. That's probably the hardest part, to really make them dedicate the time afterwards with the operating business. I'm going to answer the same question. How hard is it now? I, I know your chairman is, is a believer, so that gonna, might help. I don't know, but how hard exactly. is it at Acciona? Precisely, I was going to say that, no? and I'm totally agreeing with what Susanna said. Leadership is key, absolutely key, no? and especially the top leadership. And in our case, we're very lucky. That's true. Our chairman is a firm believer in innovation. I mean, we are a family-owned company, and we always say that uh, innovation has been at the DNA of the company since its origin, you know, and you can find letters from the founder of the company just encouraging employees to really bring solutions to the table, make sure that they implement it, and make sure that they um, expand it all over the places, you no? Know? So that's been there from the very beginning. 
and, and therefore that helps very much. But then, of course, we have to obviously work very closely with business. You have to overcome the inertia that typically big companies have, of course, and you need to find like the right mechanisms with work with your company, no, with work well. So, and there are ways to find to, to do that. No, we are also trying to implement very pragmatical innovation as well. We want it to to add value to the business. That has to be the absolute condition for that, no? But at the same time, you have to help the business to look a little bit beyond their current business, no? beyond their current problems. We need to build a little bit for the future, just talking to what we're, we're referring at the very beginning. No? So in that respect, you need a very good combination, a good balance in which trying to bring solutions to the current business and gain credibility with them to really take them to the next step, no? And it, this has to do a lot with culture as well. So you need to work, I mean, we're trying to make people change the way they work. And that's always difficult, no? So you need to prove them that that would help them in solving their problems, helping them in their responsibilities. So that's part of what we have to do as well, no? And also, uh, one important thing is try to fight against the risk adverse sometimes a um, feeling within companies and on that I think that trying to build like mechanisms that help uh, proving and, and failing fast and cheap as they say no I think that's very that's very you, you very somehow times have to activate that chairman link and get the chairman to kind of push well push their finger on the scales to get that risk aversion down well, chairman loves taking part in the startup programs that we do he shows up he likes to see him because he wants to be updated on what's going on and and how these all the people, well, the startups and big companies, no partners in the end, that that's what we're trying and to do. Politically, if he shows up, maybe people exactly. take a different attitude about risk. And that obviously helps a lot, no? And building up in a culture that really promotes innovation, no? So, well, that's, that's okay. how by, we... By the way, what, if someone says Axiona, what business is Axiona in today? How would you, because, you know, the, the, the SIC, the sick codes, which I think are kind of sick, they're kind of ill. They don't really describe things very well. What business are you guys in, or is it a, just a range of businesses? Or it's can you, a range, or but can we you... are, I would say that we are a um, technical solutions provider in terms of sustainable infrastructures, and that includes uh, from water, complex civil works, all kind of transportation, social, um, any kind of infrastructure, bridges, tunnels, ports, anything that has to be with civil infrastructures, services, by the way, and that is an example, for example, of something in which we have diversified. Besides the current service model we have entered uh, since last year in a motorbike um, serine business. Which you is, run airports, for example. Exactly. I mean, we also ones. do like airports, maintenance, and all kind of services over there, and of course renewables, which is also a very big piece of, of, the, of our businesses as well. Fantastic. Uh, Emmanuel, same question, but I'm going to give you a twist. I'm not sure if, if you were completely ready for this, but I remember when you took this new job because, you know, last year or 12 months ago or nine months ago, you were, you know, vice president of strategy and M&A and, you know, really you had like a, a serious job at Schneider Electric. <laughs> and, and, then, and then you took this job. I, I don't know. Did people say you were crazy? And, 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 and how hard is it? Um. Well, let me start by the, the first question. I'll come back to the personal side after that. Um, <laughs> and I, I promise I will answer. Thanks for the, <laughs> the question. The, yeah, it's hard because all the, inten the incentives in a large company are geared, are geared towards something else. Uh, you have a large business, especially if you're successful. Because in the case of IBM, the, the trick was that IBM was at some sense of urgency because they were not doing that well at that time. But in the case of a company like, like Schneider Electric, which is doing quite well, um, it's difficult because you have, to, you have to, to manage your priorities and your priorities are, gearing you, are taking you towards uh, doing better what you are already good at. Uh, so you would invest more in, in products and in, in things that, that will give you certainty of returns. Uh, you would place very big bets on those on those um, on on those uh, on those projects, um, and and you would try to. It's a game of economies of scale and maximizing, uh, which is which is 
has a certain level of risk. So I'm not saying it's less risky than, than the rest. It's just a diff very different nature of it. Whereas if you look at what a startup is and what an investment in, in, in the venture capital is, it's completely different in terms of how you manage risk, how you, must, you, you, you invest. Uh, the natural mortality rate of, of a startup is 98%, right? So 98% of startups don't survive. Uh, uh, so you have, uh, this is not the type of risk you want to take with those big bets in the core business. Um, and it takes five to seven years to really build something that is meaningful, to build a unicorn, for, uh, for instance. You don't have five to seven years in the core. You, have, you count in quarters. Uh, so just a completely different uh, type of profile. This is why it's hard. This is why it's hard to, be, to have that schizophrenia to do, uh, to do both things. And this is why we, we created that concept of innovation at the edge. We said, no, no, it's at the edge. It cannot be because the, the, the... It's not innovation in the middle. It's not the, innovation. The, the, the mindset, you need a lot of innovation in the middle. Uh, uh, but that other thing is different because of the incentives, because of the risks you take. It's just different. Not better, nor worse. Just, just different. Um, so yeah, let me go to the personal side now. Um, look, leadership is, is uh, okay, before you beat me because you're, you're going to, to take your business school professor hat, I think a simplified version of, of leadership would be where you tell a story, you sell a story, and you have people following you in the, into that story. A good way to do that is to be a role model, to apply to yourself what, what the, the story you believe in, so that you probably is going, going to, to secure more, more followers. So that's what I did. So I put myself at the edge. A lot of people were telling me at the beginning, oh, you're crazy, you screwed up your career, you, you had a, a real job, and now. But I applied to myself what I, th what I think is the life of an entrepreneur, and, and, and what I think should be the behavior and the, 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 the mindset that the team that is going to do that uh, needs to happen. Well, there used to be a television program on, uh, on, on television here in Spain called uh, If I Knew I Wouldn't Have Come. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw it when you were younger. And it had, you know, people would come on the show and they'd have to do crazy tricks. Nine months later. <coughs> well, it takes five to seven years. That's what I said. Yeah, but you've been at it for nine months. <laughs> well, I'm still alive. Uh, um, so far, so good. Uh, now, we, today we have uh, 80 startups we are collaborating with. Some of them uh, we have even invested uh, in. Uh, we have built that big JV with, uh, with Carlisle. We have a lot of projects with, uh, with Axiona, or potential collaborations going forward. Uh, good start, uh, but still. We'll we'll see. See, you, see you in five to, to seven years. <laughs> yeah. Let me change gears a little bit and, and ask you about, about a couple of different questions and maybe have even shorter answers if we could. But one thing you find walking around outside and, and pretty much every time we do any kind of program with anybody at the business school, big companies, they're talking about digitalization, they're talking about data, they're talking about AI. All of our graduates want to open companies to find blockchain solutions to things which I never knew needed blockchain solutions. Um, and, and everybody who could spell cybersecurity can get a great job anywhere. Um, now we have a, a company making you know, circuit breakers, a company building bridges, and a company running gasoline stations, <laughs> investing in all of this stuff. Could you help me understand this a little bit, Emmanuel, and then we'll go to Arancha and Susanna? Well, we, we do a bit more than circuit breakers. I know, uh, I know, I'm just teasing. <laughs> okay, yeah, you, you, know, you know that. Uh, no, it's... Um, how, how important is digital, and how can we make sense of all these different technologies? Well, digital is very important today because it's, we are in the middle of, of a big transformation and new technologies which are accelerating all these, all the ones you, you've mentioned. Uh, a lot of people are saying, well, we shouldn't talk about digital anymore in 10 years from now because it will be just everywhere, right? That will be a normal uh, way of, of, of living and behaving. Um, but it's clear that it's disrupting uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of business models. And this, this is the old thing of uh, software eats the world by Mark Andreessen. So it's happening in this industry like in any other. And software today means AI, blockchain, uh, uh, computer vision, and so on and so forth. And, and, uh, and any, call it an IoT construct, uh, tomorrow will be just a full charge uh, AI machine, some, maybe with some blockchain process, who knows, even some quantum computing. Uh, but it's, uh, the technology at the end should be a mean to, an end to create new businesses. Right? So the business model is 
in most cases, what you realize, even for a technology company like us, the business model is as important, if not more, than the technology. All right, Joe, uh, your view on AI, blockchain, augmented reality, machine vision, data, cyber, you've built a digital hub, what's... what's I think I totally agree with Emmanuel. I think digitalization is very relevant for organizations today. I mean, there is a big transformation and we cannot live apart from that. So obviously, and, and especially coming from sectors which didn't precisely have very much digital on it, we need to do that transformation within our companies. So we need to learn about those technologies and how those technologies can help us in, uh, and also not only in being more efficient in doing better what we do, but also in finding new business models. No? And I totally agree that uh, the digital technologies are just enablers for something. And so we need to find what is the right application of those technologies. And in a diversified company as ours, that has different answers depending on what sector and what business you're referring to. No? And so we just tried in on one side, we're building capabilities and knowledge in the technologies, and on the other side, we're just finding the use cases for those technologies and uh, very finding like the specific way to apply those to its different business. No? And that's where we are building up. But we really think, I mean, I think that the digital transformation is going to come not for just one technology, but from a combination of all of them. No? Just finding the right combination for your own businesses sectors and what, for what it may come in the future. Digitalization, blockchain, AI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything different than what Arancha and Emmanuel already said. I, I think one thing, digitalization, blockchain, AI, five years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, digitalization was something of Silicon Valley only. This is something that is today everywhere. Many people can do it. It is not something of the future. It's not something amazing. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm not trying to have the best AI software engineers inside Gulp. I'm looking for whoever has the best technology that fits me, and then find the use cases for that technology. So I remember a long time ago, I went to a professor in Stanford, <coughs> and I asked him, he's like, can you help me design the smart home? He looks at me, he's like, why the smart home? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, what are you trying to solve? And then we'll find out what is the solution to that. So start with the, what is the end that you're looking and then look at the technology that you need. And it may be blockchain. I'm not a big believer on it, but maybe, never know. Uh, maybe AI, maybe just changing customer behavior. So for me, again, as Arancha said and Emmanuel said, those are just the enablers. Those are just the tools. Uh, those tools are freely available uh, by different people. Find first what use case you need for the business you are trying to build, where you have a competitive advantage and just partner with the people who have the best tools to deliver. Emmanuel, you mentioned uh, business models. So as you change the business model, how do you explain the new business model to your customers, to your partners, and maybe even to the stock market because they know you from who you used to be. And when you start saying, I'm now doing something completely different, how, how do you tell that story? And, and, if, and if, if I'm explaining well the question. Uh, well, you start by the, the easy part. Right, let's take the example of, of energy as a service. Uh, so uh, we have more and more of our customers uh, because they are facing uh, cost issues or resiliency issues on, uh, on, on the grid in the regions where, where they operate. Uh, they are telling us, yeah, yeah, I'd like to produce my own energy. I'd like really to have a microgrid, but I'm not paying for it. Uh, so don't do Schneider Electric, don't try to come with, uh, with an equipment or a system and, or SKU and ship it to me because I'm not going to buy it. I want it, uh, but I'd like this to be served as a service, as a viable cost, because uh, energy is just uh, a viable cost for me. It was a viable cost. I just have a resiliency issue. So, just, uh, so we have more and more of those customers. So it was, it's easy to come back to them and say, oh, now well, we have this uh, joint venture with, with Carla. It's called Alpha Structure. We can deliver that value proposition. Uh, and your utility customers don't mind? Uh, maybe I don't mind what they think. Uh, that's something else, but we'll talk about that with, with Susan another day. But that, uh, um, yeah, but you may end up stepping up in, uh, stepping in the, in, on, on the, 
on the toes of, of uh, other players or so what. But, but at least, so you start by the easy stuff, by producing a business model that your customers are starting to ask for. So this is uh, before you get to... Uh, Arantxa, mm -hmm. same question. As you change, as you know, what used to be Axiona isn't Axiona because you're doing all this other stuff, how do you explain that? I mean, I think you explained very well what is developer proposition and why it makes sense for you. And the answer to that might be very different depending on the new business model that you want to implement. I mean, is it adjacent to what your current business are? Are they complementary? Do they help? Um, building on what you're doing currently, is it financially complementary? I mean, the answer to that can be very difficult, but you have to explain very well what the value proposition is and why it is relevant for Acciona to do that, no? And um, yes, going back to what we were mentioning before, having the top management very much believing on that and pushing towards that, it really helps explaining the stakeholders why it is good for Acciona to, to, to do that, no? Yeah. So. Susanna, we've got just a few minutes left on this question of changing business models or basically anything else you want to talk about as we kind of close this, this panel discussion. So I think I mentioned it at the beginning. It's, not, it's a question of, 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 of continuous education. It's about making the people familiar with it. And it's about hearing the same thing from as many different sources as you can. One thing is Susanna saying it, another thing is Susanna saying it, but I heard it in a conference, but I read it. So try to give them as much visibility, as much exposure to what you're trying to, to get is very, very important. One thing also that I think we, we did very well is while having top management engaged is important and it's actually probably the easiest people to convince the top management, then you get to the middle of the manager and there's management and that's where everything stops. That's everything where, stops. Absolutely, everything stops. So it's equally important to have different touch points across the organization to be talking not only to top management but to middle management. We had, and this is the same thing we are doing at Gulp, innovation centers where you have one leader that is talking to the top management, but people embedded into the business. People that are bringing these ideas to the business all the time. And it's very important also to have fairs, exhibitions, trips, where you pick middle of the management, the future leaders, and also expose them to this technology to make it a little bit of a competition with the middle management to, to do that. You can that. also send them to the business school if you want, but we can we, talk we about that later. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, uh, <Arantxa>. <laughs> So, sort of last thoughts on this whole topic of, of how to make transformation, how to avoid disruption, really, which is what, if I understand, all of you have the job of chief avoider of disruption to make sure that your companies are relevant as we go forward. Exactly, and you want to be part of that when it happens, no? So, well, I always say that innovation is not only a function of uh, just a concrete people, no? It's not only my function. I think, really, we need to help the whole organization to be innovative. So I think it has to do a lot with culture, with bringing culture, with teaching people on how to use like new technologies, on how they can be, helping them um, learn how they can be innovative in what they do in their current business. So I mean, programs like the entrepreneurship that we are building, I always say, no, there is a key objective, which is trying to find like new business models, just taking ideas coming from employees, but there is a second target, which is as relevant as the first one, because these people, some of these entrepreneurs will make go back to their current functions, and they will continue doing their roles, no? some of those. So helping them to think out of the box, thinking differently, bringing those ideas back to their current functions, I think that helps a lot. No? So we are trying to work very much in bringing that innovation culture, a different way of thinking, different way of doing to all the organization. Emmanuel, last thoughts on this whole topic of transformation and how to avoid disruption through innovation. No, I think it takes two things. Uh, a bit of schizophrenia. A little schizophrenia. Yeah, and creativity. And they say those two things go together from a clinical psychology well, point Well, maybe, I don't know. That's, you, you, you need to help me on this. Um, schizophrenia because you have to be always on the watch and figuring out what if someone is going to uh, to disrupt you, or if you can do the same to someone. Uh, disrupt yourself. Yeah, or, yeah, because if you become a, a very good incumbent, while well, you're just uh, becoming a big target for a disruptor. So it requires a bit of schizophrenia and creativity. Uh, but creativity is, I mean, is in business, it's as simple as and putting two things together that already exist, right? So Microsoft and Schneider Electric, or Carlyle and Schneider Electric, and you put the two together, and you have something new. You create a new business model or, you, or new technology. So, 
So this is, this is for me, what, what summarizes a bit the, 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 what, what we're trying to do here. So let me just uh, thank our, our panelist, uh, Emmanuel from Schneider Electric, Arancha from Acciona, and Susanna from Galp. I'm not sure we could call these companies what I used to call them, because I'm not really sure what these companies are becoming. But it's clear that they're going to be part of the future, and they're going to be relevant thanks to the hard work and the, and the amazing innovation that's happening all over the place. So thank you very much, and thank you for the audience for your attention.